Get off my lawn. But first, subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you hit that notification button so that we get to annoy you every time we upload a video. The Magic Dads podcast is now available wherever you listen to podcasts or on YouTube at the Old Cranky Man Collectibles YouTube channel. Magic Dads is brought to you by Old Cranky Man Collectibles and all of our generous patrons over at patreon.com forward slash MTG Dads podcast. Go check it out for exclusive content and so much more. podcast here on the old cranky man collectibles youtube channel i'm your host blake and i'm here with your host hi i'm stefan <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to be here i'm not muted at all <laughs> how's it going uh, it's, it's an excellent night it's an excellent night to talk about magic colon the gathering <laughs> <laughs> you know earlier in the week on the podcast uh on the Can on the canlander podcast we were talking about the initiative Yes. Uh, so <laughs> there's a lot to <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. Um, so the the initiative is this mechanic that was introduced in the in the Baldur's Gate Commander decks, right? Yeah. Uh, in the in the uh, the limited environment, truly, right? Like it was a it was a draft set that had the initiative inside of it. Yeah. At so every rarity. This is this is a mechanic that was designed for multiplayer play. Hundred percent. Right, yeah. and this is not the first example of this mechanic or card specifically that was designed for multiplayer play that has kind of worked its way into you know competitive one v one formats uh -huh. and just been completely cracked. Uh huh. <laughs> I think the first real example of this. Um, it's true name nemesis. Yeah, yeah. Going back to what was that? Uh, that was a commander precon. Yeah, it was one of the commander precons. I'm not sure which year. Off the top of my head, I think it was 2016, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah, true name nemesis. Uh, this card that you know says when it comes into play, you choose an opponent, and the true name has protection from that opponent. Yeah, you pick up right. A player. So in a multiplayer game, you you got four people, sometimes more, generally four. True name comes down, you pick one player. True name has protection of that player. The other two players can still interact with true name. Yeah. Okay? So it. when it's just you and me playing, and I play my true name, I pick you. Yeah, and it's not a it's not a situation where you could have like a ley line of of what is it? The ley line that stops them from targeting you. Because it's not a target. No, choose, choose a player. Yep. Yeah. And, choose an and so there's no way to stop it, unfortunately. Like that's there's no counterplay to it. If you yep. can't So we so we're going back here, you know, quite a few years, almost a decade, but True Name yeah. Nemesis is really the first example of this. And when that card came out, all of those commander products are, are automatically legal in legacy. Mm -hmm. And so now True Name Nemesis is legal in legacy. And it was it was really, really big in the like blue white X uh, stone blade deck because yep. you can take your true name and you can put a piece of equipment on it like an Umazawa's Jite and just just wreak havoc on your opponent. Oh yeah. There are, of course, ways to interact with the true name yeah um, like a but, wrath of god or, but or... It, of course uh, but now it creates the situation where like you have to play these very specific answers to kill mm -hmm. the true name and i don't think that that true name is by any stretch of the imagination the most egregious of these sort of format breaking cards um Not but it's, it, it's really just like the hallmark like this is the first time that we saw this yeah. sort of thing happen right? yeah and I, I i do want to point out that it's not just mechanically some cards like this that have an impact on on formats sometimes financially it's a big deal yeah so true name has been printed i reprinted i think i know at least once but i think twice yeah, yeah battle bond and then uh and it was another set one of the master sets or something like yeah. that um so you know when you when it was only available in that one commander deck and you bought your commander deck and you got one copy of it mm -hmm. the the market for that like is through the roof and the supply of that card is very very small so it so it creates this 
like that first of all that commander deck is worth a huge chunk of change yeah. now way more than the, way that, more than the intended msrp it was the and, 2013 was the okay. commander deck and, and then was, the the individual yeah. card itself is astronomically overpriced yeah specifically because it's good in 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 multi or specifically because it's good in in 1v1 formats which let's be honest it was just legacy and vintage it yeah. sort of became uh, a very powerful spell in legacy and vintage because it was a creature that represented a, an almost insurmountable inevitability and you could pitch it to force of will yeah though most definitely yeah yeah uh, he attack he protect yeah oh yeah he protect and... all day <laughs> sometimes he ditch to break your neck there so uh, i think i think the next sort of multiplayer this is a mechanic uh, that that made its way into one v one formats is mm. the monarch. The monarch, yeah. This was the uh, the second conspiracy set. So this conspiracy take the crown um, with Marchesa Long May She Reign. Uh, so the the monarch mechanic um, functionally uh, requires sort of a token. It's not a token per se. It's actually a game state like day night or initiative. We'll get on that later. Um, but, but it's a it's it's, it's, it's a, a game, game state, state that has a static, static effect. Yep. And then there's cards that sort of rely on the monarch as well that have an effect if you are the monarch. There's cards that sort of benefit you for staying the monarch or benefit you for, even if you're not the monarch. That mm -hmm. if you're not the monarch, they have an effect. And again, this was designed for multiplayer to sort of encourage combat, which I like. That's great. It's sort of sort of a cool incentive to move the game along. You know, get on with it. Um, but in 1v1, if you have a good board state, uh, yep. it's going to just draw you a card every turn. Because yep. I, I played a game of Canadian Highlander today where, um, you know, my opponent got the monarchy. I don't remember what card they used to do it. And, and, and didn't matter how many times I took out their threats, they just got to stay the monarch. And, yeah. and I was never able to, you know, take it from them. And they just drew a card and then drew another card and drew another card. Yeah, what, just... is that, what is the game state? What, is that, what does the monarch say? Oh, it says that at the beginning of your end step, if you're the monarch, draw a card. Yeah, and then if your opponent, if a player ever deals combat damage to you, they become and the again, monarch. has to be combat damage Correct. to you, the player, not your yep. planeswalker, not a battle to you, the player. Then they take the monarch and they become the monarch until they're dealt combat damage. Yep. Or you play a card that says you become the monarch. Right. Like you play one, um, and that card advantage sort of becomes this, this insurmountable uh value engine mm -hmm. in 1v1 mm -hmm. where it's very hard to interact with especially in formats where your creature light again like yeah. legacy or mm -hmm. in a format like popper yes where uh yeah it sort of took over it, it did yes the mono black deck had thorn of the black rose and then the the boros decks had um uh palace Sin sentinels? sentinels yeah palace yeah. sentinels and and uh, emissaries of trust yes the one um, so those are sort of the three that saw the most play, um, but yeah, that's and even today, those those monarch cards see play in Popper regularly mm -hmm. just because of how good they are. Yeah, they do a really, really good ancestral recall impersonation. They come Absolutely. down and they're a body, and the turn after they come down, you get to draw a card, and now you create a situation where your opponent has to use a removal spell to kill it, or has to connect with you with their creatures, possibly trading you know, one of their creatures in the process, there's your card economy right there. That's effectively an ancestral recall. Yeah. And you're you're basically making bad attacks just to get it away from your opponent. Right, yeah. Yeah. It, it incentivizes poor poor management of resources almost. So I gotta tell you, every time somebody them. every time somebody introduces one of these sorts of mechanics into the game, <laughs> uh, I just like I'm like, I don't know how to play magic anymore. Your eye twitches a little bit. I forgot. <laughs> Give a little check boxes on top. Because now I'm um, like, I'm like, I can't let you draw cards every turn, but I also have to figure out like how to make it so I get to draw a card every turn. Like you're right, it, yeah. it, it does encourage combat, which is which is cool. Yeah. But also yeah. when you introduce this mechanic into a multiplayer environment, there's very, very, very few game states where one player is going to be able to keep that and maintain it. Mm -hmm. it you know, it very, very drastically different from a yeah i played a lot of this limited format and 
nobody stayed the monarch for more than generally two turns. And and I know for a fact that R&D's intention was to make this something that is to be passed around. Yeah. And it, it was the intention with, is for it to be yeah. shared. It was designed for commander or not necessarily for multiplayer. Commander. It was designed for multiplayer. And mm -hmm. let's be honest, the most popular way to play multiplayer is, is commander. commander. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it is a commander card. It's not a commander card, but it's a commander card. No, yeah. no, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the next example of this is the initiative. Oof. And I think that by far the initiative has been the most parasitic of all of these formats uh, or all of these um, mechanics. It's toxic. It's parasitic. It's unhappy. It's very powerful, um, but it definitely creates scenarios where uh, your opponent has to make some very poor gameplay decisions. Yep that aren't permanent that sort of like rely on unknown variables right like um in, in order to wrest value away from your opponent because mm -hmm. you're not you're not just taking the initiative to get the advantage from the initiative you're wresting it from your opponent because right you don't you want them to them have, have it. it yeah you You'll cannot die. yeah right. absolutely the monarch is sort of one of those situations where they're going to draw extra cards and it's sort of going to be difficult for you to come back from that there's a mode on on the initiative that just domes you for a quarter of your life. Yeah, it's it's a lightning axe. Yeah, it's sick and it's yeah. zero mana. Another thing that I really hate about about the initiative is that you have to have so many different game pieces to track it accurately. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you got to have the token to pass around, and then you have to have a dungeon for you and a dungeon for your opponent. Yeah. And, and um, I don't even think, want to think about tracking that in Commander. Additionally, <laughs> they also sort of messed it up because they wanted to have they wanted to incentivize people to play these cards in draft. They they and I say messed it up. They designed it in a way that I don't think is good for competitive Magic because they said whenever you take the initiative from a player, you, when you take the initiative again, you move through the dungeon. And yes, so it. In, in the way where Monarch, you only get a single static benefit every right. turn. The initiative, you can... The most cards you can draw from being the Monarch in a turn is one. one. You can set up scenarios in, with the initiative where you run through that dungeon in a single turn. I get, can attest to this, have yeah. done that myself it's several absurd. times. That's, I mean, th there's a reason the White Plume Adventurer is banned in Legacy now. They not Not only were they way wrong in the way that they made this, but they were way wrong, or sorry, not only were they way wrong in, in letting this mechanic work in 1v1, but they were way wrong in the way that they made it, period. Yeah. There's yeah. no reason why every time you take the initiative, you should get to venture into the dungeon. No, it should have been, it should have been a trigger at the end of your turn. Just or like your upkeep in the same way that the Monarch right. is. But if they design it like the Monarch, you would get that benefit at the end of your turn. So the resource that you gain, you can't even use until your next turn, mm -hmm. which is good. That's a good thing. Yes. And then you have to defend in order to get the benefit to, again to on your it. next turn. Mm -hmm. But it also incentivizes you to attack your opponent to try to get that from them. Uh, and then to set up appropriate blocks, right? Because you don't want them to get that value back and you don't want to end their turn. And it allows, allows for an additional amount of counterplay where if they take it from you, you can then flicker your creature before the end of their turn. Take it back and then, and then take, take it take again. It and then they don't get that. Like, there's some cool counterplay that could have been there, but they sort of wanted to push it. I I get it, but it also, it it, it makes it a little bit too powerful, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah. Um, so what, there there is sort of another level of commander cards. I have one more card oh, I yeah, want to talk go about. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So the the last sort of instance on this uh, on this list is Chaos Defiler. It is oh, the most recent God. addition to cards that are intended for multiplayer play uh, that have weaseled their way into one v one formats and are absurd. Yeah, what does it do? Yeah, so Chaos Defiler, uh, you'll see it on your screen here in just a second. So Chaos Defiler is a five mana five four with trample. It is an artifact creature. That's important. It's from, it's from the Warhammer 40k Commander Precon. Yes. Yeah. So when it enters the battlefield or dies, so or it, gets dies. You, it gets you coming and going. Yep. For each opponent, choose a non land permanent that player controls. 
-hmm. destroy one of those permanents chosen at random. Okay. So So for each opponent. (laughs) Yep. So if you're in a multiplayer pod, you have three opponents or however many, you pick a permanent for each of them, and then one of those permanents, just one of the three or however many you pick, chosen at random gets destroyed. Correct. In a 1v1 matchup, you only have one opponent. And and I I missed something on there. Does it say target? No, it absolutely does not. This can kill a true name nemesis. It can kill lands, too. Non-land. Oh, not it's a non-land permanent? Okay, so... It, it can kill hexproof things. Yes. It can get around protection. Kind of, yeah, it can get around protection. Mm-hmm. It, there's no stopping it. And you can yep. tinker for this. Yes. So not, only, <laughs> so not only does it take away the multiplayer aspect, but it also takes away the randomness of it. You just get to yeah. pick something and blow it up. Yeah. Coming Absurd. And Coming and going. Uh, it also has trample. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a big body that'll end the game. <laughs> It's sort of an absurd card, and it's, again, like, it's designed for that multiplayer play. Yeah. Because it does a cool thing in multiplayer. Yes, it does a multiplayer thing, it does a random thing. Uh, not nearly as powerful as, you know, when you just get to vindicate your opponent twice. Yeah. So, I do want to talk about cards that were designed appropriately for multiplayer, and that's stuff like Bountiful Promenade, which are the lands oh, that come sure. in untapped unless you have additional... Yeah. Come in tapped unless you have additional opponents. I think they didn't, they have not, or that is to say we haven't yet seen enough cards that play to that, where there's a restriction, there's a downside to the card unless you're in a multiplayer. So, speaking of the, specifically, I think that that same text could probably be applied to the Monarch and Initiative and just fix it. Yeah, if you... If you add it on, and this isn't even an edit, you could. This isn't an errata to the cards that provide these game states. No, this it's just an errata to the, the game state, to the token, effectively, yeah. to a part that doesn't appear on any text, any rules text of any of any right. card. That you could just say, if you have more than one opponent, mm-hmm. do X. You could right. even apply it to the initiative to say it happens at the end of your turn, at the yes. beginning of your end step, venture further into the underdark mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is sort of an unexplored territory of making errata to these things mm-hmm. to make them function in 1v1 sort of less powerfully or even mm-hmm. not at all. Right. You could say that the monarch doesn't even draw you a card unless you have more than one opponent. Correct. And that would be totally fine. Yes. I think that would absolutely be be a beautiful design decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Wizards rightfully doesn't like to to edit cards like it doesn't like to errata cards no because it we we've talked about this on the podcast before yeah um functional erratas is one of the worst ways to deal with it because there's a lot of feel bad surrounding that where you have a group of players over here that are in the loop they have Mm -hmm. all of the information that they need they're aware but then you also have a group of people over here who are not Mm mm-hmm and when you, when you mix these two groups together, it can create some serious feel-bad situation where people from group B don't know that there's a functional errata and they play the card as right. it's printed and written and, and that's yeah. how they read it, that's how they play it. And then you have these other people who are like, well, we've got bad news. Yeah. Uh, and in that situation, uh, and funny enough, and this is sort of a divergence, but the original Monarch token had a error on it. <laughs> yeah, it so they sort of screwed it up in two ways, right? It said, uh, how is it worded? It at the said, beginning, your end step. Draw at, right. There was no yeah, of. <laughs> yeah. And I love that token. I still I still love that. But. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> they had to make a corrected version in, in the Commander, Commander Legends because, you know. And, and I will say that, that in that set, they introduced the monarch again, but sort of toned it down a little bit and like really did it right. And, and we could talk about how wizards sort of like goes all in on some mechanics that they don't foresee being overpowered, but then end up do being overpowered. Um, but I think that there's definitely a world in which wizards of the coast looks at some of these mechanics that function a little too powerfully in one V one and make that command decision to edit or errata the token or the game state, because obviously Monarch and Initiative aren't really tokens. They function as tokens, but they're not, they're not game tokens, pieces per se. Um, 
where they could just say, okay, we're changing how this functions. And I would, I think it would have less of an impact on the player base, that is to say the people that own the cards, than something like the companion mechanic. Mm -hmm. Like where the companion mechanic has a full errata on right. reminder text. Yes. And this... It is a printed card that you put in your deck that you play with that does not function the way that it's printed. Right, exactly. And this would be even less than that. And it would solve a lot of issues. I think that Wizards of the Coast needs to be more open to making powerful cards that only function in one view or only function in multiplayer mm -hmm. if they're incredibly powerful. And that limits how much impact they're going to have on competitive magic. I say that I genuinely do not think they knew how powerful the initiative was. Oh, no. Absolutely I don't not. think they had any idea that, that completely caught them off guard. Yeah, I, it, I think it caught everybody off guard, to be honest. Like, I don't know a person that initially saw the initiative. and I oopsed into those cards. Um, Same. Be, yeah, because I was building a Dungeons & Dragons-themed commander deck, and I literally took the binder at the game store and opened it and just, like, went through it and was like, oh, this card looks cool, oh, this card looks yep. cool, oh, this card looks cool. And then when it blew up, I was like, uh, I own most of this already. <laughs> I, I started playing White Plume Adventurer because it was a 3-3 three, three for three that in the colors that I wanted to play mm -hmm. and it untapped creatures on my opponent's mm -hmm. upkeep. And I was like, oh, that's great. Any additional value I get from that? Super mm -hmm. duper. Yeah. And I just, I slammed it in and then it won me several games. And I was like, oh, okay, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I drew it, it suddenly... I get to look at the top 10 and do what? Yeah, I sort of ran through dungeons pretty easily. And like the first time I dealt five to my opponent, I think that I put them within lethal. Like they didn't even see it coming. Like mm -hmm. they were at, I think they were at like 12. Right. A, a lot of people of didn't even board. know what it did. They were just like, yeah, eh, it's a dungeon. I've and I was seen like, this okay, before. Five to you. Oh, I have lethal. Okay. Attack you for lethal. <laughs> and that's sort of unfortunate. Um, so there, there from, from a financial perspective, again, there was another card that sort of entered one V one from a commander product that was scavenging news. That is, that predates even True Name Nemesis. Yeah. Yeah. But it was like a staple in the Maverick deck in Legacy it was yeah. really, really popular back then. And it's kind of the same the same thing as True Name Nemesis is you could only get it from that commander precon. And it, the value of that card was through the roof and the value of the deck that it, that it came in was through the roof. And ironically, now you can get it anywhere, right? It's, it's dollar, been it's reprinted. Rare. Yeah, it's been reprinted. But that's what they should times. do. Like, it's, sure. a, it's a pioneer staple now. And sure. I think that's a totally fine card. I don't think it ruined anything. No, just it didn't. It. Printing. Right, right. Up uh, front, that was just a financial detriment. So I wanted to talk about another card that is effectively a commander card because it's not legal in anything else. Um, but it has created some sort of financial issues. Oh. And I don't enjoy the card because Wizards of the Coast, whenever they feel like, uh, whenever they feel like cashing a check, We'll just put this in a set, and that's Mana Crypt. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I cashed in a check. It's they just put true. Mana Crypt in they take They take these sets, and they go, okay, well, this is sort of a reprint set. Do we oh, want to put a Mythic wow. in the set that's going to sell the cards, that's going to sell packs for us? If yes, hit Mana Crypt. This is an crypt. amazing take. I love this so much. And it, well, we, we kind of circle back on that scavenging goose, and the reason I brought that up was because Scavenger Goose was so expensive at the beginning because of the limited print run, and it's so powerful that Wizards of the Coast, it correctly made the decision to print the heck out of this card to get in as many hands as possible because it was so format-defining in every format that it's legal in. Mana Crypt is really only legal in one format, and it sucks that it's so expensive because yeah. a lot of people want to play it. I don't even like the card. I think it's not a well-designed card and the formats you can play it in like vintage and like canadian highlander it represents some really poor card design uh it's five points in canadian highlander right now which is sort of debatable but it lets you have a start that is near unbeatable it's like Ooh. snorting adderall right off the gate and like and Eight mana crypt. Yeah, go on. Because I've never won a flip. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of the other thing. Is like some sometimes it 
Mana Crypt can turn games into non-games for mm -hmm. two different reasons, and it sucks. Like, either it's a non-game because your opponent got to utilize every ounce of mana that drips out of this thing, regardless of how much damage it does to them, or they're using it for value and they 12 themselves from it. <laughs> and it's too much randomness for too much power and it is a it's sort of like the original commander card before commander cards right it was the book tie-in where you'd mail away for it and you get it back and unfortunately is that how you got it originally yeah you, you'd buy a book and you, there was a card there was a postcard inside that you had to mail away to wizards of the coast for a copy of this card and they mailed it back to you there's a i think three huh. different cards you could get um in that in that thing um one was arena i think um but i don't remember if the exact specifications but i know mana crypt was one of them it was the only way to get that card and it wasn't legal in anything it was basically a portal card um so they are arena yep sewers of estark okay yeah wind seeker centaur <laughs> okay powerhouse giant badger oh my god and mana crypt yeah mana crypt uh, the best of those, not close. Um, but but it was sort of the first of those, you know, we're not talking about Nilothni Nil Dragon or anything about limited print runs or anything like that of mechanically unique cards. Because Nilothni Dragon sucked. That was, if you don't know, it was a card that was printed specifically to be given away at Dragon Con, which is the, uh, which was a convention where I think Wizards had one of their first like big tournaments. Is that why that card is so expensive? Yeah, it was a limited print run that was only given away at that convention. I always um, wondered why that card was so expensive. It's not good. <laughs> it's very bad. Um, but imagine if it was good, right? If it was good, then, yeah. we were, then Wizards of the Coast... Mana Crypt status. Yeah, they can put this into any set that they wanted to do mm -hmm. in the future as a reprint and just go, all right, let's put it at Mythic and then pull the trigger and we'll sell out like mounds of this set because every Commander player wants this and you know they want to cash a check <laughs> yeah so the the last series of cards that i kind of wanted to talk about is the cards are the commander cards that have had a sort of detrimental impact on commander um and this sort of circles around to designing cards for command for rather designing cards for multiplayer versus designing cards for commander so there's cards that reference having multiple opponents, and I can forgive that because there's lots of different ways oh. to play multiple opponents. But there are specific instances where cards reference your commander. And generally, I think that's a net negative for the format. Um, so you're talking about your deflecting swats. Yeah, your, exactly. Your fierce guardianships. These are the cards that really... Or there's those ones that have, like, Commander Storm, where it does the thing for each time mm -hmm. you've played your Commander from the Command Zone. Exactly. There's also my favorite uh, Command Tower. Yeah. Which is <laughs> absurd. And remind me again, is Commander an officially sanctioned format by Wizards of the Coast? Or is there another body that actually functionally manages that format? Just as a reminder... Wizards of the Coast doesn't actually manage that format, no, but they, they are designing not. cards for it. Correct. And they're actually bringing in the people that manage the format to help to help design, design the cards. cards. This is accurate. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> is it though? I don't know. I don't think interesting it's a good it is. It... <laughs> but ultimately, I think w Commander is at its best when it's weird, and it's weirdest when there's no cards that are designed for it. When if w Wizards of the Coast oopsies into a card, that right? Is more I, I I do I do I do I am picking up what you're putting down. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's sort of uh, that's sort of my gripe. Let's call it my old man yells at cloud moment. <laughs> <laughs> is it a death cloud you're yelling at? Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so like that's sort of sort of the issue is that there's a lot of these commander cards that come in and do a lot of things and there's a lot of commander cards that are great in commander i love a lot of these commander cards that are good in commander because they're just fun and silly and like a uh, hot take i think dockside extortionist is a super fun card i like <laughs> it's super silly it's super fun it punishes your opponents for playing too many artifacts are there ways to abuse it absolutely but it's just a silly goblin like the the fact that it's expensive sucks. 
and Wizards probably just needs to reprint it a bunch. It, it has been reprinted a few yeah. times. It is, it is getting better. Still, yeah, it is getting better. But it also feels like they made this card, they oopsied into a really powerful card it, in a precon, yes, and then is. they used it to cash some additional checks. It is very powerful, and yeah. they did indeed use it to cash multiple additional checks, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to the next few years so that they can you know, use Commander to ruin more games of 1v1 <laughs> Magic. You can do we appreciate it. you guys listening to Magic Dads, and uh, we just want to remind you that uh, we're proud, we're of, proud you. of you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.